Hello, thanks for tuning in to the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Chamberlain Osawa, Channels Television here in Abuja. I'm joined by Vincent Makori from Voice of America in Washington. Well, thanks. I'm Vincent Makori at the Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Let's start off with the letters from Nigeria. Chamberlain also in Abuja brings you that story. Delegations from 49 countries and the African Union attend a three-day U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit in Washington, which began on Tuesday. It is the first of its kind since 2014. Well, therein, President Joe Biden announces U.S. support for the African Union's admission to the G20 as a permanent member and touts its support for food security and climate change. 45 African leaders are here attending the U.S.-Africa summit in the hope that their countries will be better off at the end of this three-day summit. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the United States would announce investment for exchange programs for the African students and to support African entrepreneurs and small businesses. Over the next few days, we will be announcing additional investments to make it easier for students to participate in exchange programs between our countries to increase trade opportunities, for members of the uh, African diaspora, and to support African entrepreneurs and small businesses. Each of these investments is guided by one overarching goal, to continue building our partnership so that we can better address the shared challenges we face, and ultimately, we can build a safer, more secure, more prosperous future for all of us. It's not all about economic sway. Thank you. It's part of a renewed push to boost ties with a continent where U.S. interests have been challenged by China's security ambitions and trade and investment and lending drives. Regarding Russia and China, the, you know, the PRC, we're witnessing the PRC expand its footprint uh, in the, on, on the continent uh, on a daily basis. And as they do that, they're also expanding their economic influence. A troubling piece there is that they're not always transparent in, in terms of what they're doing, and, uh, and that creates uh, problems that will be eventually uh, destabilizing if they're not already. Um, in turning to Russia, uh, we see Russia continuing to peddle uh, cheap weapons. Uh, some of that was mentioned uh, before by one of our, our senior leaders here. Uh, and also, um, we see Russia employing mercenaries across the continent. By contrast, Beijing has held its own high-level meetings with Africa every three years for more than two decades. While well, Sino-U.S. competition is a clear backdrop, U.S. officials have been reluctant so to frame like the gathering as a battle for influence. Washington has toned down its criticism of Beijing's lending practices and infrastructure projects amid calls for some African leaders for more U.S. leadership. Investing in bees is true, but investing in human capital is the best option. And this is a very serious challenge to Africa, particularly where the, the, the fiscal capability or the revenue capability is very limited. Providing service delivery to the people, increasing the quality of health, education and health, and issues like that is, is very important. Investing the uh, civil society groups, these are the issues where changing the mindset of the society is the fundamental issue. That is the bottom, that if you push, so many things will change. Earlier in the week, White House National Security Advisor Jack Sullivan said the United States will commit $55 billion to Africa over the next three years. And during the summit this week, it will discuss 2023 elections and democracy on the continent with a small group of leaders. Joining me now to discuss this is African Affairs Analyst Achike Chude, who joins us virtually. The U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit has ended in Washington, D.C. Considering how it turned out, what is your assessment of the outcome also as announced by President Biden? It is early days yet. That nothing, yes, there have been some agreements that they want to uh, support, um, you know, Africa for a permanent seat at the United Nations. Uh, they want to, I mean, there are so many other things they want to do. They want to partner with Africa, especially at the economic level. They want peace and prosperity in Africa. They want democracy, you know, and the rule of law uh, and the human rights issues to be respected in Africa and so many other things. So these are some of the things that formed the bulk of uh, the discussions that they had. Well, some say this might end up as a talk shop. 
Do you think they have a point when they say that? It is only in the implementation. You know, there's an old African saying that uh, the sweetness of uh, the soup is in the testing. And so it is, uh, there are still many months ahead. This is not the first time they are having this kind of, um, you know, summit. They had it even with Obama. And then the Afri African leaders have also been doing that with uh, many other, you know, um, uh, you know, heads of state across, I mean, especially in Europe and in Asia. You know, so uh, it is in the implementation that we'll see whether it is, um, uh, actually, you know, it was just a talk shop, one of those things for the, you know, photo ops, or whether uh, it is actually going to translate into something. U.S. President Joe Biden says the U.S. is all in on Africa. His administration announced billions of dollars in support and investments for Africa. Do you think this is an attempt to influence Africa and counter Chinese involvement with Africa? Uh, we must not forget where America is coming from. America used to hold sway in Africa, America and Europe. They, have, they lost out a long time ago to the Chinese. And now you have so many other you know, foreign powers coming to America. And that's why people are beginning to talk about, into Africa. And that's why people are beginning to talk about the, another scramble for you know, Africa. Uh, it's an opportunity for Africa, but whether Africa is actually going to take it and then, you know, uh, look at Africa has become the beautiful bride. And uh, now so many suitors are wooing her. Uh, simply essentially because Africa once more has become a, of a, you know one major geopolitical uh, importance in the world now, uh, and so can we play it right? Um, uh, with that is that that will be left in the immediate future and in the far future. Uh, we, we can't say for now. We can't. We just hope that uh, African leaders are beginning to understand that uh, they need to up the ante. They need to begin to do things differently. When America says they are all in. And what are we now going to do to the major, uh, um, you know, foreign uh, power that has been much more influential in the past two decades in Africa? That is the Chinese. The Chinese are definitely good, not going to be all out. While they are not going to give any space to the United States, they are not going to, you know, concede an inch of uh, the gains that they have made in the continent. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, so uh, I think it is going to be a very difficult situation for the Americans. They left. You know, and if you look at uh, the quantum of uh, investments that the Chinese have made in Africa in the past uh, few decades, you know, up to, uh, till, I mean, up to this moment, they have spent about, uh, they invested about $261 billion in Africa. America has, that of America has dwindled to about $64 billion. So how are they going to do catch up? How are they going to catch up exactly? So it's going to be a very difficult situation for them. What kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, structure, you know, uh, are they going to put in place? Uh, to show the Africans that uh, they really mean business. And of course, you know that the Africans right now are not going to ditch the, the Chinese. Of course, they are indebted to the Chinese, uh, you know, to so much. Uh, you know, and then uh, there's so much investment that they have done in them um, in Africa. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult for America. Achike Chude, African Affairs Analyst, thank you for your time on Africa 54. It's a pleasure. Thank you. More frequent and severe drought in Africa are hampering food production, especially in arid parts of the continent where farmers struggle to eke out a uh, living. A water retention system developed in the U.S. is helping African farmers fight the trend and improve crop yields in drought-affected areas. Juma Majanga reports from Kibwezi, Kenya. Under the scorching sun in the Ulilinzi village of southeastern Kenya, Farmers are engaging in unique land preparations. Exacerbated by drought from climate change, the sandy soils in this area, like in most arid and semi-arid areas, has made it nearly impossible to produce abundant crops. However, a new water retention technology developed in the U.S. is giving farmers here new hope. We had a lot of government funding into the millions and millions of dollars to put all of this whole system together and then test it in Texas, Arizona, California, and Michigan. And these were all four universities that worked with us. So this is not something we put in a little container in the backyard, my backyard, and now we're saying it's the best in the world. We have tested the technology with cowpea. We have also tested the technology with maize. And we realized that farms where we had installed these membranes were more productive. The technology has so far been tested in Zimbabwe and Kenya and is getting good reviews. 
When this technology came, I was trained on how to make my sandy soil farm fertile. I saw the benefits and deployed it in my farm, and I can say that this technology is working very well because now I get a good harvest. When it was used on my farm for trials, I harvested a lot of maize. Even now, we have vegetables which you can't find anywhere else around here. The International Center for Tropical Agriculture is among the organizations spearheading trials of the subsurface water retention technology in the sub-Saharan region and says it can bring about a green revolution in the long run. In addition to the technologies, farmers, if they continue uh, applying, for instance, manure, uh, retaining their crop residues in the soil, reducing the tillage in the soils, then there is build-up of organic matter. So even in five years to come, the yields that we have been witnessing in the plots with, with, that have the technology are expected to be much higher. A key drawback of this new water retention technology is the high cost and labor involved. The challenge now is making this technology available for farmers in remote areas who need it the most. Juma Majanga for VOA News, Kibwezi, Kenya. Faced with East Africa's worst drought in four decades, Kenyan President William Ruto's new government lifted a decade-old ban on cultivation and importation of genetically modified maize last month. That decision has come under fire with critics saying it was rushed and failed to address seed availability and long-standing health concerns. Kenya's drought has ravaged crops and livestock such that the region's wealthiest country struggles to feed its population of 55 million and has consistently had an annual deficit of 10 million bags of the maize staple. The gap is filled by imports, but supply has come under unprecedented pressure in recent years from land fragmentation, urbanization and skyrocketing prices of inputs like fertilizer exacerbated by the war in Ukraine. Ruto, who was sworn into office in mid-September, said the move to allow GMO crops was necessary to help ensure food security, an argument swiftly dismissed by maize growers and a smallholder farmers group that has filed a lawsuit against the decision. The maize we are growing is uh, open, they are open pollinated varieties, which means if they bring in the BT seeds or the uh, GMO seeds, if uh, we, we, ha we have to avoid the contamination, then it means that we'll have to have that isolation distance. The isolation distance from the BT maize to our indigenous maize, which is about almost 100, 100 meters. Farmers cannot afford that. Conversely, Daniel Magondu, who has grown GMO cotton over two seasons, shares his enthusiasm. In a field bordering a lush avocado orchard close to the rice basket town of Mwea in central Kenya, he points to rows of weeks old cotton seedlings as evidence that GMO seeds are superior to conventional varieties. Next to the GMO crop, seedlings of the traditional variety in a smaller plot are smaller, less lush, and have started being attacked by aphids. This cotton, it has not even taken a month. And you can see the size, how it has grown so quick. The reason why we like BT cotton, or why I like BT cotton, is one, it has an early maturity, it has an inbuilt resistant to cotton borewarm, and it produces more balls than the conventional cotton that we used to grow. GMO crops, which are often seedless, pose a threat to a sustainable tradition of storing and recycling seeds, leaving maize growers dependent on big foreign companies that own the patents to GMO seeds. This controversy mirrors problems in other African countries, which are earlier adopters of the technology. Farmers in Burkina Faso, Africa's top producer of cotton, say the quality of their crop fell after the introduction in 2008 of modified varieties. 
Solar panels that mushroomed on rooftops and on the ground in many parts of the world, but they also can be placed on bodies of water. As VOA's chief national correspondent, uh, Steve Hunman, reports, the floating solar technology has taken off on a large scale in Asia and Europe and is now beginning to heat up in North America. Who said there is nothing new under the sun? One of the hottest innovations for non-polluting generation of electricity is floating photovoltaics, or FPV, which involves anchoring solar panels in bodies of water, including lakes, reservoirs, and seas. Some projects in Asia incorporate thousands of panels to generate hundreds of megawatts. FPV got a head start in Asia and Europe, where it makes a lot of economic sense with open land highly valued for agriculture. Floating solar projects are even more attractive when they can be built on bodies of water adjacent to hydropower plants with existing transmission lines, according to Sika Gonzaku, a researcher at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado. In countries that depend again on a lot of hydropower, there's concerns around what does power generation look like during droughts, for example. And with climate change, we expect that we'll see more extreme weather events. And so when we're thinking about droughts, there is the opportunity to then have FPV as another renewable energy option in your uh, toolkit, essentially. So instead of depending so much on hydro, now you can use more FPV, reduce your dependence on hydro during like very dry seasons, use your flowing so, uh, photovoltaics. Floating solar systems have another benefit. They reduce light exposure and lower the water temperature, minimizing harmful algae growth. That all sounded rather promising to officials in the town of Windsor in Northern California's wine country. 5,000 solar panels are now floating on one of Windsor's wastewater ponds. The floating panels are easy on the environment and Windsor's budget. 350 metric tons of carbon dioxide yearly, and they also provide 90% of the power that we need for all of the operations for treating wastewater, for all the operations at our corporation yard, and also for pumping our wastewater to the geysers, which, which is a geothermal field about 40 miles north. The town leases the floating panels from the company that installed them, which gives it a set price for electricity on a long-term contract, meaning Windsor is paying about 30% of what it previously spent for the same amount of power. That made gaining constituents' approval easy, says Windsor's mayor, Sam Salmon. It's not like we've invested in something and we're not going to get a payback. We're getting a payback as we speak, and we'll get a payback for 25 years. This lake in Virginia is one of about 25,000 bodies of water in the United States identified by the government as suitable for FPV placement. Floating panels covering one-fourth the area of each of these sites would potentially generate nearly 10% of America's energy needs. Steve Herman, VOA News, at Smith Lake in Stafford, Virginia. Banks dispense new Naira notes in bits. Their issuance has been much anticipated, but finally, Nigerians can now lay their hands on the redesigned Naira notes and already some are relaying divergent experiences as the commercial banks begin the dispensing of the notes. However, some others say they are yet to receive the new notes in any of the denominations. The CBN governor, Mr. Godwin Emefiele, had announced December 15, 2022 dates for the official issuance of the notes to the public. The new Nara notes are in the banks and it's already being disbursed to Nigerians as directed by the Central Bank of Nigeria. From Lagos to Abuja and other parts of the country, some customers are accessing the new notes with excitement. However, the notes are rationed. It's better. It's okay, even though they say they, say they spend more to uh, print this. It's, the texture is okay, it's nice. Even though we've not seen the uh, lower denomination, like they said, but it seems we've seen that of 1,000, it's okay. Well, you know, in the Nigeria situation, I would say I'm not disappointed for the situation of the country. We know if our government promises us something, we have to wait for some time before they implement it. So they just announced it that it's going to be uh, in circulation today. And getting to the bank, we are not getting the new note. It is not yet to Huru, as some are still hoping to get the new note. Some of the automated teller machines, which are supposed to be reconfigured to dispense the new notes, are still dispensing the old notes. 
They told that they will start using the new money on 15. But I came yesterday and today I come, but I never see the new money. Well, I came into the bank today to make some transactions, to lay a complaint first and also do some transactions. Uh, surprisingly, I was expecting to see the new notes, but it was the old notes that were there. Even some people who were at the stand felt disappointed because they actually came out because they already spent the old notes they were having just to get new notes. And some of them actually went back inside to lay complaints about it, but I just had to live with it and move on with it. Nevertheless, some do not consider the redesigning of the notes as a solution to the nation's economic challenges. Changing the economy of Nigeria is not the made of, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not currency made. It's not education that comes from the currency, whether uh, they have printed 1,000, they have created, printed 500 and any uh, uh, notes. It's not. It's our character. The character of the Nigerians. It is the one that will change the economy of our country. I came to the and I would draw new notes. I was expecting I would go, I'm going to see a, uh, a lot of changes in the, in, the, uh, in the new note. The only thing I see is just the color. As you can see, in my, uh, as you can see I'm showing it. Whereas the dispensing of the new notes officially started on Thursday, December 15th, it is still expected to continue until January 31, 2023, when the old notes will no longer be a legal tender in Nigeria. The White House is bright with holiday cheer, an annual tradition meant to delight and remind Americans of the importance of the end-of-year holidays. This year's theme is With the People, a nod to the most powerful force in America, the American people. Viewers Anita Powell reports from the White House. Three, two, one, here we go! Yeah, okay. Christmas at the White House is always lit, but the seasonal decor also has deeper meaning, as shown by this year's theme, We the People. Those are the first three words of the U.S. Constitution, which every U.S. president vows to uphold. These simple words encapsulate an American ideal. that the world's wealthiest and most powerful government derives its strength not from its leaders, but from an empowered citizenry. The soul of our nation is and has always been, we the people. And that is, yes. <laughs> and that is what has inspired this year's White House holiday decorations. The values that unite us can be found all around you. A belief in possibility and optimism and unity. Room by room, we represent what brings us together during the holidays and throughout the year. That's a lot for a nation of 330 million people, 50 states, some 400 spoken languages, and all of the world's major religions. Well, welcome to the White House, guys. <laughs> Welcome to the White House. And uh, <laughs> Eid Mubarak. Happy Diwali, everyone. <laughs> Merry Christmas and happy holidays. God bless you. Here's how the White House tackled it through decor with festive music, with lifelike tributes to the beloved White House pets with a 140-kilogram White House replica made mostly of sugar, and with lots and lots and lots of lights. 83,615 of them, the White House says, and 77 Christmas trees. Will all the people like it? Of course not. But that maybe underscores the American people's mightiest superpower. Not only can anyone freely say what they think, but every four years they can decide who gets to live and decorate here. Anita Powell, VOA News, The White House. And that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Channel's television has our last word. We look forward to bringing you another show next week, but do remember, channelstv.com is your veritable source for news and other programming. I'm Train Balloon, so thank you for watching. Goodbye.